<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Jake, and I'm here with Brad on Never Did It. We look back at the last 100 years of movie history in an effort to fill in some of our own movie blind spots. Today, we're covering the year 1974. Brad, you chose for me a movie called The Gambler. Tell me why you chose The Gambler. Because it's freaking great. <laughs> it's James Kahn's best leading role. Sorry, Scott Kahn's dad. Apologies to Scott Kahn. That's right. Uh, I hate to typecast myself, but I can't help it. It's a Jewish story. It's a story about what it means to be addicted to gambling, that it's not actually about winning, that it's about losing, which I really liked. The other day, I saw Jake Johnson's new movie, Self-Reliance, and that made me think about, that was his directorial debut, but he's written a handful of movies, including one called Win It All, which isn't a remake of The Gambler. I mean, the remake of The Gambler starring Mark Wahlberg, but it's a movie that's quite similar about a guy who is addicted to losing. And this The Gambler is about a guy who's who's kind of got it all and and wants to lose it all. And even when he squeaks by and gets by the skin of his teeth, survives, uh, doesn't get killed by his bookies, he still wants to lose. And I just loved watching that destruction. And for all the people, I saw this after I saw Uncut Gems, and they're, it's very similar to Uncut Gems. I think Uncut Gems is actually the remake of, of Win It All. <laughs> I mean, of uh, The Gambler. I haven't seen the Mark Wahlberg version. No one did. <laughs> well, yeah. I thought this, I like this more than Uncut Gems. I thought, I believe this guy more. They're both about hotshot Jews who can't handle life without the thrill of gambling and understand that losing means you can finally stop. I think Jake Johnson, I heard an interview with him recently where he talked about that was his clue. Like he went and he gambled somewhere and he was up a lot, but he felt like he had to keep going. And when he lost all his money, there was the depression of losing all your money, but there's also the relief of, oh, now I can go home. Like now I know it's time to go home. And mm -hmm. There was just a lot of that in this where I'll just explain real quick. The plot of the movie is Scott Kahn's dad is a uh, he's a uh, is, is he a professor at a school? Yeah, he's a, like a literature professor because he's always yeah. taught, he's teaching like Tolstoy and you know, the, the, the classics. Right. And he's addicted to gambling and he's pretty good at it. And he comes from a very rich family. His uh, grandfather is loaded. His mom is also well-to-do, and he's very involved with his mother and his grandfather. They're they're all very close. And he goes on a losing streak. And Paul Sorvino, who is his friend, but also his bookie and tied to the mob, is his link to that world. And then he just spirals out of control as the movie goes on. And the questions are like, how is he going to pay his bookies, basically? And how many of the people in his life are going to get dragged down by him. I was just really compelled. I was glued to it. I watched this in 2022, and I remember it. I mean, I, I, had a, I had to question whether or not he was a professor or not, but there's actually a pivotal scene in the movie where he get, brings his students into it. Yeah, I just, it's incredible. I loved it. What do you think of it? Yeah, well, yeah, that's the, I mean, that's like the crescendo of the movie. I mean, that's like the most tense scene in a movie full of tense scenes is that basketball game. Uh, and, and man, they really make a high school basketball game uh, really, really tense. But yeah, I like this movie a lot too. I'm one of the camp also that I, I like Uncut Gems more than you do, but I, I definitely agree that Uncut Gems had to have been influenced by this movie. I, I mean, definitely had to have been. Yeah, James Caan, Scott Caan's father is just is great in this, certainly one of his best leading roles and and it's he I mean he's addicted to, to gambling yes you know he's addicted to losing yes but it's also he's he's addicted to the danger part of it too i mean he he likes the danger and the fear of it because even after i, I mean i don't know if, is, is it okay if we spoil this 40 i was gonna say it sounds like you're about to spoil the final scene of the movie i, I mean can can we i mean can we give a spoiler spoiler alert spoiler alert you know if you don't want to know you know skip ahead you, you know because after he loses after he loses everything, he goes and puts himself in a legitimately dangerous situation in which, you know, no money is going to be gained or lost. It's just putting himself into a dangerous situation just for the sake of it. And so I, I, I think he's got more, even more problems than just losing a lot, you know, owing a lot of money to the mob. I mean, he's, uh, he's messed up, man. Well, you didn't actually spoil the ending, so... I guess you didn't have that's to skip that's right. I, I did find a way to say it in a little. Yeah, I did find a way to say it a, a little more uh, vaguely. Yeah, he goes and gets involved with some um, of the less secure parts of society and pushes them to their breaking point. I That scene I thought was incredible, like masterful and really put the movie over the edge for me. I was like, oh, oh, is 
is this the best movie of 1974? For me, I think it is. So it was directed by Carl Rice, who I am not familiar with at all. Same. I, and and uh, looking through his filmography, I, I I don't know any of these other movies. So this was clearly his most popular. French Lieutenant's Woman. Uh, Meryl Streep was nominated. That's one of her nominations. I haven't seen it, but I know of that movie. This is the first time I've ever heard of it. That's about it for me. But this one, wow, what a banger. Um, just re- like you said, really tense from top to bottom. Great performances all around. Well, what do you think of Paul Sorvino? Great. I mean, it was uh, I mean, kind of the part Paul Sorvino was born to play, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, like kind of the you know mobster who had to be kind of a little bit scary, but also a little bit, uh, you know, he's, he's a little sympathetic to to the, you know, the gambler character, but also. He, he wants what's best for him because you can't get money from a dead guy. Right. So he's like, he's nice. That line really well, yeah. yeah. That was another one where I was like, this, he's doing a lot here and the script is also doing a lot with this character um, without shoving it in your face. I read your, we're going to get into Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia in just a second, but I read your review of Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia on Letterboxd where you said, like, this is the ultimate 70s movie. And I really think that The Gambler is the ultimate (laughs) 70s movie. Whereas Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia is like a grindhouse movie almost. Uh, uh, yeah, that, there we go. <laughs> it's not violent, like I mean, it's violent, but it's not gory or 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 exploitative, really, like a grindhouse movie. There is some sexual stuff that is, yeah. but but this to me, the gambler, where we feel a little bit removed from the main character, but we still spend a, like all our time with him. We understand what's going on from scene to scene. We get why he his character evolves in the way it does. Whereas in Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, I feel like, and we'll talk about this in a second, there is a moment where there is a sharp right turn that the character, that the main character makes that changes the entire trajectory of the movie, like very suddenly. That actually doesn't happen that much in 70s movies, but does happen a lot in modern movies where there's like this inciting incident. Whereas in The Gambler, it's much more gradual. Yeah, I see that. Do you want to, here, well, let's talk about Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Why did you recommend me this film? Uh, because it's just nuts. Man, it's just, <laughs> it know. is. Um, you know, it's a title that gets you know thrown around a lot, and I think it's a title that like gets thrown around even if like you actually haven't seen the movie. People have just like heard that title, just you know, bring me the head of whatever you know, because it's like such a weird movie title. It gets like parodied or mentioned a lot, and um, you know, I'd seen it a couple of years ago. It was recommended to me by a friend of the show, Jeff Richardson, when we were doing a, a, a film series with each other. I think we were doing what we called road movies, and so we were picking out movies where the you know were significant portions of them were taking place you know on on the road, and this was one that he had uh, or he or we had selected, whatever it was. I I had just seen it a couple of years ago and uh, I just, yeah, I thought it was really wild and different and crazy. And I, I you'd think you'd seen a lot of the other movies I'd seen from 1974. So this seemed like a good one to uh, revisit and, and talk about. So I've always been curious about Sam Peckinpah movies. This one is one of those. Yeah. And um, uh, because the first one I had ever heard of was Straw Dogs. And my introduction to Peckinpah was he directed the original Straw Dogs, and then there was a remake that came out probably like 10 years ago now, maybe more even. I was just, I was not that familiar with like rape revenge movies. So the idea of Straw Dogs really struck me. And then the fact that there was one that came out, you know, decades ago really surprised me. And that it starred Dustin Hoffman really surprised me. Dustin Hoffman, the king of New Hollywood. Absolutely. Uh, I just yeah. watched Midnight Cowboys. So yeah, I'm on that train. There you go. Well, that's la- Actually, I knew you had done that. I think when we were walking home from Zone of Interest, there was a car that pulled into the crosswalk as we were crossing Houston Street. And Andy goes, I'm walking here. And I was like, you know, Jake just watched that movie. <laughs> yes, I um, did. I got to rewatch it. I haven't seen that in like 15 years. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Bob Balaban, baby. So I was interested in Sam Peckinpah. I watched The Wild Bunch and I actually had recom- that I had it on the list for you for Never Did It. But in the two years since I've watched it, I've forgotten almost everything about it. So mm-hmm. I replaced it recently with something else. Uh, so we won't be covering The Wild Bunch on Never Did It. But we can talk about it a bit here just in that it's very violent. And it was like the thing that put Peck and Paw on the map because he made this gritty Western. I don't think that, sorry to all the Wild Bunch fans, I actually don't think that that movie holds up super well. Not to my memory anyway. Whereas I do think I'll be remembering Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia for quite a while because it's a much more focused story. And why don't you tell us what the plot of Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia is? Well, it's it's fairly simple uh, until it goes off in some, some wild directions. But it uh, you know takes place down in Mexico, in Mexico City. Yep, and there's uh you know there's a drug lord, and right at the very beginning, his very pregnant daughter is brought in, and he demands to know who the father of uh, her child is. Under some very extreme duress, she uh, admits that the father of the child is Alfredo Garcia, and of course. 
he demands the head of Alfredo Garcia. In fact, he tells his minions to bring him the head of Alfredo Garcia. They say the title right away, which I I, I love that. Don't waste it's, any time. Just say the title. Get that out of the way. They um, say it in two but, languages. First, he says it in Spanish twice, and yeah. then he says it in English. A lot of this movie is in Spanish. A lot of the movie is in Spanish. Yeah, probably it's almost like 50-50. Yeah. Yeah, quite a lot of it is in Spanish. So that's... You know, the, that's the conceit of the movie is that he, you know, this struggler wants, uh, he, he wants Alfredo Garcia to be dead. So two of his, uh, his henchmen go and find, oh gosh, I can't remember his name already. Well, his name is Warren Oates. Right. The actor's name no, is Warren his, Oates. Uh, his name is Benny. He says it like a hundred times in the movie. I'm Benny. I'm Benny. Benny, Benny, Benny. That's right. So the drug lord, two of his guys go and find, uh, they go to this bar and they find Benny. He's an American and they go and find Benny and they think that Benny's a guy who can track down, can track down Alfredo Garcia. So they, you know, offer him, you know, some money to go track him down. And turns out that his girlfriend also, you know, had a relationship with Alfredo Garcia. So he, and she tells him that, she was with him the other night and then he died right after being with her like got hit by a car or something he was in a drunk driving accident yeah it was a drunk driving accident he'd been hit by a car so alfredo garcia is dead already he's like oh well that's really convenient for me because i need to prove that he's dead so i can get money from these guys but also you come with me uh so that we know he's dead so that he's you know no longer a threat to our so i know that he's no longer a threat to our relationship and then we can get married and everybody will be happy so they basically go on a road trip he and his now i guess fiance go on a road trip to find the grave of alfredo garcia so that he can uh dig up the grave cut off his head and bring it back to this drug lord you know just a tip typical day yeah so some of that there's a little more nuance to it than, than just that i mean i know it <laughs> but uh so he, the 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 two American thugs who find Benny, they don't actually hire him. He gets the idea that he can extort them for money. So he goes and asks, he's like, how much for, he goes to their boss and asks how much for Alfredo Garcia. And they say five grand. He goes, give me 10 grand and give me five grand. Now they're like, here's 200 bucks. Go do this yeah. thing. <laughs> I love um, that. Yeah. He asks for five grand and gets 200. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you know, he's kind of a loser. He was, uh, he'd been in the, in the military. So he knows how to shoot, but he, he's, you know, he, he, then he ran down to Mexico to drink away his life. He's mad. He's like really furious that his girlfriend slept with Alfredo Garcia. <laughs> so he part of this is like a revenge thing. He's like, screw Alfredo Garcia. We can get out of Mexico with this money. And she's actually quite sensitive. And a lot of the first half of the movie is sort of his attitude kind of like wearing her down and breaking her down. It's really sad. It's awful. I mean, he's awful. Yeah. And she's really sweet, even though she had this affair. She had the affair because he wouldn't tell her he loved her and because he wouldn't propose and only after his romantic rival is dead and that he's trying to convince her to help him with this grave robbery will he propose to her it's insane <laughs> yeah it is a road movie i'm curious before we get into more about this movie what other movies were on your road movie list uh you know what? actually i believe i have the list on letterbox was the road on your road movie list i'm pretty sure oh you mean the, the vigo mortensen one yeah though the cormac mccarthy story oh yeah uh, uh no i don't think it was well, that's actually relevant because my whole review on Letterbox of Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia is Cormac McCarthy, but make it simple. <laughs> okay, here we go. I found, yep, I do. We do have the list. It was, uh, we had Vanishing Point. Don't know it. Uh, the Straight Story, David Lynch's. Terrific. Um, yeah, wonderful movie. Uh, Thelma and Louise, great movie. Never did it. Oh, man, you'd love it. Tulane Blacktop. Never heard of it. Uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Mm -hmm. The Last Detail, which we've covered on the podcast. Sure did. Badlands, which we didn't cover on the podcast, but we've mentioned, I think, or at least I've mentioned a couple of occasions. Yeah, Terrence uh, Malick, baby. Yep. <laughs> uh, Easy Rider, which again, I know we've mentioned on the podcast. Bonnie and Clyde, uh, which I think we've mentioned before. Five Easy Pieces. I watched that recently, Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, Bonnie and Clyde's really good. There's a funny scene with Gene Wilder that is not the kind of scene you'd expect to pop up in that movie. Absolutely. I remember exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, the last one was the Wages of Fear. Never so heard of that. Like the movies that we uh, that we had done. I can't believe you didn't do Duel. Yeah, you know, we probably would have gotten to it, um, but you know, I think we had moved on to another uh, another series. You know, I mean, we, we did eleven movies. I mean, that was that's a that was a good run. I'm watching. I'm in the middle of watching seventy Walter Matthau movies, and you're bragging about one. <laughs> Just watched uh, uh, Ride a Crooked Trail which I expected to be really bad because a lot of his early stuff is not so interesting. And like, I just watched onion head and it's awful, but ride a crooked Tra trail is cool. In the beginning of the movie, math, I was like, stop. It's a Western. And he's stopping people from coming into the town and this guy shoots him. But then 
Netho just gets right up and he's like, I like you, baby. <laughs> we go have a drink together. I've really simplified what happened there, but uh, I was just like, this is exactly what I was looking for. So bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. There's a scene early on in their road trip where they're having a picnic on the side of the road and Chris Christofferson and his friend show up and try to sexually assault his girlfriend. And this is the scene I'm talking about where it just seems like, I mean, spo- okay, major spoiler for Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Skip ahead if you don't want to know anything about the plot beyond what we've already said. Benny kills the bikers as um, Alita is making out with one of them under sort pretty much under duress, although he seems sensitive. I don't know. It's like very strange, this scene. Really weird sequence of events. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, he, Christofferson holds them at gunpoint. Uh, his friend, played by Donnie Fritz, keeps uh, Benny at the fire while Chris Alverson goes off with Alita. He strips her down against her will, but then he like walks away and seems like he's sad and she follows him. And it's very not clear what anyone's motivations are at this point, but it doesn't matter because Benny shows up and kills both of the bikers. And then he becomes like a different guy. He just becomes so much more aggressive for the rest of the movie. And he's wasted and angry. To me, that's not how... A, a movie should go. It just was very yeah. upsetting. <laughs> and then from there, he kills everyone. He kills absolutely everyone. Anyone, yeah, pretty much anyone he comes across. Yeah. The final scene, we're still in spoiler territory, folks, uh, where he finally <laughs> makes it to the boss who wanted the head of Alfredo Garcia, reminded me so much of Django Unchained, the 100%, yeah. at the end. I think Tarantino hates this movie. Oh, really? So I, whenever I watch a, a, a gritty 70s movie, I look in uh, cinema speculation. I look in it and he called, I think he called, bring me the head of all, he says it in like a very flippant way, but it's like, he pretty much calls it a heap of trash. Oh, wow. He says, he's a, hold on, I want to find the exact quote. Okay, the exact quote in Cinema Speculation by Quentin Tarantino. He's talking about a different movie. I, I'm not going to go back and see what he goes, but you would think the man that went rooting around like a truffle pig in the garbage dump that was bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia might be inspired by Thompson's dolly-like paint stroke. He called it a garbage dump. Wow. Now, did he call it that because it was trashy? Because it is. It is. I mean, by design, yeah. Did he call it that because he hates it? It's the only mention of the movie in the entire book. Uh, Seems like he's not a fan. I am a fan to the point that while we've been talking about it, I bumped it up from three and a half to four stars in my letterbox. Nice. It's funny that you say that because while we were talking about The Gambler, I bumped it up from four to four and a half stars. <laughs> That's why we do this show. That's right. Now, I want to talk Oscars, but this feels like a couple of movies that do not get nominated for Oscars. They do not. But I do want to talk about the Oscars a little bit because, yeah, bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. I mean, yeah, not even there's no awards going anywhere towards that movie. It was a major, major flop. No money and no one liked it. <laughs> Yeah, nobody saw it. Critics, even at the time, it wasn't even like, you know, ooh, it's an art house or, you know, a critical darling, whatever. No, it wasn't. Nobody liked it. Yeah, Yeah. nobody saw it. The Gambler, though, it did not get up for any Oscars, but James Caan was up for the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Drama. But if he had been up for the Oscar, here's who he would have been up against. That would have been the year of uh, Albert Finney from Murder on the Orient Express. Terrible performance in a great movie. And yeah, I knew you had seen that fairly recently, too, right? Yeah, I I love... Uh, the Hercule Poirot character, and I hate Finney's portrayal of it. <laughs> Bummer there. Uh, but then also Dustin Hoffman from Lenny. Oh, that's one of my favorite movies ever. Which I knew, yeah, again. And then Jack Nicholson for Chinatown. Um, there you go. And Al Pacino from The Godfather Part Two. So he wouldn't have stood a chance anyway. Right. and then But then the guy who actually won that year is a guy named Art Carney, Harry and Tonto. Oh, well, I love Art Carney. I just watched Last Action Hero. I take any chance possible to talk about Last Action Hero on this podcast. Art Carney has a very small role in that film as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's favorite second cousin. And the entire conceit of the movie within the movie, the movie series is called Jack Slater. So the plot of Jack Slater 4 is they kill Jack Slater's favorite second cousin. He's coming for revenge. And Art Carney plays the second cousin. And just before he dies, he's like giving this information to Jack Slater. He's all beat up and he goes, I'm out of here. And then breathes really heavily and falls back and dies. It's incredible. Last Action Hero, I just rewatched it like three days ago. It's a five star movie. I cannot express enough how amazing Last Action Hero is. Never did it. We got to get you to do it. I know we already did that year. We did it's it, we did Schindler's List for that year. But man, we got to get you to watch Last Action Hero. We'll find a way. Okay, yeah. So Art, anyway, Art Carney is really good. He's also in this other uh, movie I really like called Going in Style that was remade by Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. It's where like old dudes rob a bank. Uh, so Jack the, Nicholson? 
I think it was, isn't it? It's Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine, Alan Alda. Sorry, Alan Arkin. Arkin, Michael, yeah, there we yeah. go. Alan Arkin, Michael Caine, and Morgan Freeman. They remade it, but the original is Art Carney. It's directed by Martin Brest, the amazing Martin Brest of Midnight Run and Beverly Hills Cop. That's right. Uh, George Burns, Lee Strasberg, who was the villain in Godfather Part Two, mm -hmm. and Art Carney, they're the old men in the original. It's great. I love it. Um, anyway, so you were, I think, trying to make fun because no one knows what the hell this movie is. Well, not even make fun because I haven't seen it, but I'm just thinking, like, would you expect, like, you know, hey, list these five performances. Who would you expect have won the Oscar? Not a lot of people would, you know, mention, you know, when you're going up against Pacino in The Godfather Part Two, And then Fair even enough. some of the non-nominated, non uh, some of the other guys who were up for Golden Globes that year, you had Gene Hackman in the conversation. And yeah. then you had uh, Lemon and Mathau were both up for the Golden Globe for uh, the front page, which we, right. we talked about earlier, too. So, I mean, it was just, I mean, for lead actors, that was just a, that was just a banner year. It really was. I love Art Carney. I won't say a bad thing about him, but <laughs> it was a really competitive year and just like one of the best years in movies ever, which is really, really wild because I think the year before might have been actually kind of, no, no, I'm thinking of 83, four years earlier, 1970, just a dismal year. Zone. Yeah. Uh, but then 1974, one of the greatest. Yeah, well, well, it's we can do our. Do you have a top? Did you have a top ten for seventy? Do I or? have a top ten for nineteen seventy four? I love nineteen seventy four. Are we are we ready to do that? Are we ready to close the book on Alfredo Garcia and uh, and the gambler? I think it's time. I think so. Real quick, a couple honorable mentions. Really, just one honorable mention. And it's Murder on the Orient Express. I already said how I feel about it. Great movie. I do not like Albert Finney's portrayal of Hercule Poirot. Number ten is Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Uh, number nine is The Man with the Golden Gun, the weirdest James Bond movie, I think. Uh, and for that reason, I adore it. I think he fights a sumo wrestler in this one. It's so strange. <laughs> number eight is The Year Without Santa Claus. It's a Rankin and Bass claymation movie, and I know every song by heart. Um, it's my favorite Christmas movie, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite Christmas movies. Number seven is Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. The Scorsese movie, I think his only movie with a woman in the lead role. Number six is The Conversation, uh, which we talked about. Gene Hackman, um, directed by uh, Coppola and uh, one of the few films, one of the five films starring John Cazale. They were all good. Number five is The Front Page, Lemon and Mathau in the remake of His Girl Friday. We talked a lot about that last week. Number four is The Taking of Pelham 123. It's a Ma it's a Walter Mathau double shot. The original Taking of Pelham 123, uh, where Walter Mathau and Ben Stiller's dad, Jerry Stiller, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Robert Shaw as he hijacks uh, a subway car. Oh, so, um, great. so great. Number three is The Gambler. Number two is Lenny, which you brought up, Dustin Hoffman as Lenny Bruce. And number one is The Godfather Part Two. That's excellent. My list will have uh, some some overlap there. I do want to mention uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore with my release date thing that didn't actually open in the U.S. until 75. That was mm. the year Ellen Burstyn won the Oscar, so I counted it as a 1975. That's the only reason it's not on my uh, 74 list. Otherwise, I think it's great and it would be on my list. I really like that movie a lot. My number 10 is kind of a tie because I have I've seen 11 movies from 1970 and these two I kind of you know kind of are outliers I have the year without a Santa Claus as well kind of have it as a kind of its own thing because it's a TV special sort of thing and I love that you have it at all that makes me so happy Oh, yeah. I have it ranked and everything, and I really enjoy it. It's really good. Um, I just have it kind of ranked separately with this because I also have um, one of Scorsese's early documentaries, Italian American. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not they're So I have them both kind of like they're not quite the feature films that like the rest of my list is. So I have them kind of ranked here at the end sure. at number 10. But Italian American's delightful. You meet Scorsese's mom. She's great. I mean, she's mm -hmm. super cute. It's like 40 minutes. You know, it's it's on it's on Criterion. It's fun. OK, but then the meat of my list. Number nine is The Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, yeah, I do enjoy that one. Number eight. Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Number seven, Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein. Mm. Oh, which I was surprised. Neither of Mel Brooks' movies are on your 1974 list. Young Frankenstein's like number 12. Ah, okay. So my number six is The Gambler. Number five, then, is Blazing Saddles. And Blazing Saddles, I just haven't watched in so long, I don't have a rating for it. Ah, makes sense. Number four is, uh, and this is where it gets real sticky for me, uh, number four is Chinatown, which I just think is amazing. It's another uh, one I haven't watched in so long, I don't have a rating on it. Ah, it's a great one. Uh, number three is The Conversation. Uh, number two is one that I had identified as a 1973 movie, but I have since changed into a 1974 movie. And my number two is Badlands, Terrence Malick, his first movie, Badlands. And then my number one is The Godfather Part Two. Why did you change uh, Badlands? Because of a release date? 
Yep, because I realized I had it on the wrong uh, release date. It didn't actually come out in the States until 74. Got it, yeah. Uh, I, let's see. I'm, I'm just going to real quick look at where it is on my 73 list uh, because I don't have this information at my fingertips like you do, so I just go by what Letterbox tells me. Yeah, I started doing, um, I, I created a spreadsheet where like I'm, I'm going through my letterbox, you know, I'm going through like by each year and mm-hmm. then looking up the actual release date of each movie. And that's how I'm coming up with my top tens for, you know, when we're doing this, you know, like when I did it for 1974, so I knew that was the year that we were doing. You're a smarty. So I started looking at my movies for like, you know, 73, 74, 75, that run of years. So I could see, and that's why I thought, you know, saw Alice doesn't live here anymore. It's like, oh yeah, Alan Burstyn won the Oscar in 75. I have changed so many of these covers. I can't easily tell what Badlands is. <laughs> um. Oh. Oh. There we go. Okay. So it's that one. It's number thirteen on my 1973 list. Mm. 1973. Also, wow. What a year. Holy crap. I can't wait till we get to that because I have given you. Oh, did we already do it? Yeah, you gave me Long Wolf and Cub. Gave you Long Wolf and Cub. Oh, that means we're not going to do Charlie Varick. Ah, Charlie Varick. Fine. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for 1974. We don't know what we're doing next week yet. We're going to figure it out after we say goodbye. But if you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. We have a Facebook page now as well. You can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash Never Did It podcast. I'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.